Joji. How are hey, you? Good. Hanging in there. Good. Good. Um, I see. Uh, you know, we've been doing these talks with with a lot of the artists, and I'm so glad to get a chance to sit down with you this morning and, and talk to you. And I can see some of your artwork in the background. Are you in your kind of home studio? Is that? Yes. Yes, I am. I work out of my house, which which I rent. Uh, but um, yeah, my living room is my studio. My dining room is my office. Two more bedrooms in the back. Also, I, I sand, I cut, and sometimes I do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I think it's a well-balanced uh, approach. Um, do a lot of work, a lot of not doing anything. Yeah. You and I met, I'm going to guess, let's see, around the mid-90s, we did a show. We, uh, Peter Lodato introduced us. And we did a show of yes. Peter's paintings and your sculptures. And, uh, and you yes. and I immediately hit it off. And, uh, and we've been yeah. kind of working together loosely uh, ever since. So, so 96, 2006, like 24 I years. So. Mid, mid 90s. Yeah. He, my Peter was generous enough to uh, include me. And thus we had a two man show on 72 Market Street where your gallery was and uh we had we had a lot of fun yeah that that sort of lurched me in into further into my career of fine art and uh yeah since then and and i'm sure you have not forgotten that after a couple of shows we did together you started um la international yes and in which i was involved as a graphic designer and that was a lot of fun we did that for i don't know close to six or eight years uh yeah well the la international was every two years and it ran mm -hmm. from 1993 to 2003 <clears throat> okay and, uh yeah and you came up with our fantastic logo which was a picture of your brother uh, looking at a uh, oh, yeah. at a guide with a, a globe and and so on and um, it really worked. It was uh, it was a really yeah. fun time. It and, was it was an image. Um, yeah. So that that image that I created was one of my specialties back then in the nineties. Since I graduated. Cal Arts. Uh, I graduated with graphic design and photography majoring. And my career, main career up till then, was graphic design and also making images like that. This was pre Photoshop era, where I photographed things separately. Uh, for commercial purpose, and put put those images, separate images together, uh, to make a single image. And uh, when in in process of doing that, I would actually make, build, and construct different parts of that image in in actuality. And I started realizing that although I enjoy photographing them, but I actually really, really enjoy building to be photographed. Mm -hmm. And I think that now I look back that that was a segue into me building sculptures and building things basically and those sets and props and things that i used to make 
became my actual work. And, yeah, and, and you know, I immediately responded to them, as did our clients. And um, you know, when we were talking yesterday uh, about sitting down to uh, have a discussion, you were a little reluctant to talk about the actual work itself because you, you know, you sort of you know, had a reticence to. Uh, having to explain or talk about the meaning of it and so on. And, and we had a really interesting discussion around that. And um, I, I very much agree with that. You know, I don't think it's really should be the artist's job to talk about or explain their work. And I love work that um, has a level of ambiguity to it that requires the viewer to participate and, yes. and, figure stuff out even if it's an abstract painting you figure out what your emotional reaction is you start to explore the painting or the work of sculpture um, yes. and and i know when you first started doing these pieces you know um you didn't really know uh you know what to say about them other than you loved making these things and there and i started to see this playful sense of humor in them where you would take a uh, a found object like a chair or um, uh, a, an arrow or um, uh, you know a musical instrument and you would deconstruct it and then reconstruct it in somewhat of a cubist fashion where um, you would flatten the geometry of it uh, oftentimes or you would uh, take an arrow uh, you know like a in an arrow with feathered tip at one end and uh, you know an arrowhead at the other but it would be bent in a circle. And I started to see that there was a very playful um, quality. First of all, the craft of it was very appealing to me. You know, you, you wanted to get in and, and really look at the um, way it was lovingly made with a lot of skill. Um, and, and there was a sense of, you know, to me, a real appreciation of the materials you were working with and the, the life the object had had previously. But then you kind of very subtly removed the functional aspect of the object. So it was just a, the appearance of the object. You could say it's a chair, but if, if what a chair is, is to function as something you sit on, that function was no longer there. So is it really a chair anymore? What is it? And uh, I loved that, that dichotomy. It, it, it had a very kind of a Magritte quality to it. You know, that famous painting of his, Cisse uh, ne pas un pipe, um, where it's a painting of a pipe, but the yes. language under says, this is not a pipe, which is true. Yeah. It's paint on canvas. Uh, yeah. It's an illusion. And so yes. you would create these wonderful illusions from actual objects of the ghost of their former history. And I just love yes. that. And so you may not want to talk about them, but I've loved talking about them for the years. Well, you know, uh, now that you mention that, uh, I'm always fascinated by ironies and mm -hmm. contradictions, idiosyncrasies, uh, things that don't make sense, but it does. Right. Or, or things that make sense, but if you really think about it, it doesn't. You know, uh, thing, things like that is, I call them the peculiar things in life. And they're everywhere, you know. And sometimes you see these peculiar things and, all, and often these peculiar things that I see, and of course it's subjective, so every one of us think differently what things are peculiar. But when I see them, I, I you know, it's, it's, um, it sometimes, it can be used as the beginning of an idea. Yes. Can, can, can I use that peculiarity, peculi peculiarity? As, as the starting point for my work mm -hmm. as an idea. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But
but um, that that's what I'm of, often fascinated by. And um, my my work, not all of them, but it it is based on those things like contradictions and mysterious things. Uh, you know, for me, yeah, in my my view, and and because for me, without those things, you know, like life. Well, life can still be interesting, but those are one of the most interesting things in, in life for me. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. And that's really, you know, one of the things I, I think people have responded to in your work is that it points up some of the ironies and contradictions in life, uh, you know, in a playful way, in a way that uh, invites you to kind of be surprised you're sucked in to thinking it's one thing and then you realize the irony sort of after the fact is you're really starting to think about what mm -hmm. this is and you realize that this this uh, very elongated hammer, for instance, can't function as a hammer because it's exact because of the exaggeration, even though you see it as a hammer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you, I think- But, but also, but also, Bill, Sometimes when I'm making something like that, mm -hmm. I'm laughing. Yeah. Because it's really funny to me. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I love that. It's just, it's just, I, I just love making funny things. Well, and there's something very, to me, there's also a love of, there's the humor, but also there's a love of the craft that I see in your work that, that to me feels very Japanese. You know, I think there's a tradition, you know, when I see something that's been made in, in, in Japan, it's generally uh, wood or stone, but there's something about the craft of it that is elevated to a level of elegance and poetry and definitely is there in your work. So I would love to talk a little bit about your background and you know you grew yeah. up you, well that, yeah. that about that that part i thank you for um saying that but i i see woodworkers craft crafts cabinet makers and japanese woodworking and it is just way beyond me and it's so precise and it is so uh uh, beautiful and yeah. and I my craft is not at that level and that's okay I tell myself that's okay um, one of the things as a background because I came from a commercial art background specifically graphic design and typography where I was trained to be so precise and so picky and and detail oriented and critical um, of my your own work and others and you have your layout ha has had to be perfect and your type has to be perfectly balanced and graphic designers uh, thrive in they take yeah. they're proud of their craft and i was also but when i started doing fine art in the 90s i realized that being so picky and so calculated and analytical hindered me mm -hmm. from going deep inside of me and drawing creativity and energy from my heart. Yeah, no, I from think I, I, I rather true. than from my head. Yeah. No, I mean in, in your work there is definitely a, you know comes across the love of the materials you're working with and the objects you're working with, but not to a degree that um, loses the sense of spontaneity and playfulness. 
you know, exactly. so there is a little bit more looseness, we could say artistic license with the, the, the actual mastery of, of a Japanese woodworker or whatever, but um, mm -hmm. still there's a nod to that tradition uh, very much mm -hmm. that I see in your work. So to, uh, yes. how, talk a little bit about what your life was like when you were growing up in Tokyo. How old were you when you, when you left Japan for the United States? I was 18. I was 18. So I, I grew up in the smack in the middle of Tokyo. Um, uh, from, you know, up, up till 18. I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I had a great childhood. I had so much fun. Um, you, may, you may not know that, uh, yeah, well, if you know history, Tokyo was pretty much leveled and after the war. And although my mother was always pro-American, according to my mother, the, the Japanese, the, the, you know, citizens wish that the Japan would just lose and, and get it, you know, war would be over soon. Mm -hmm. So my mother was so happy that they lost to the Americans. And the Americans came and they left. You know, it was one of the few successful American story, stories of going in, rebuilding, and quickly leaving. And then, you know, the Japanese did not went into a turmoil after the Americans left. Uh, wouldn't that be great if that happens again, you yeah. know, when the Americans interfere? Uh, anyway, um, when I was growing up, although this is in a district called Akasaka, and it was not 10 minutes from uh, Japanese parliament, 10 minutes from the Imperial Palace. And I grew up in the fields in the middle of Tokyo. There were open fields and trees and grass and insects have, have come back, I heard, but not later because we went and collected insects and dug uh, tunnels and um, played in bunkers, uh, b bomb shelters. Uh, but around my house, now it is all built up, uh, was, was, was just everybody, everybody left. Uh, you know, Tokyo was burned and everybody left. And um, that was the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a great childhood. I had no idea what happened then, obviously. But all I remember was just open fields and playing. Beautiful. Did you say yeah. Osaka? I'm sorry? Uh, Osaka was the, was uh, the city? No, Akasaka is a Ak district. Akasaka is a district in Tokyo. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and then, you know, I went to regular uh, private uh, uh, junior high and high school. And, but as, as long as I can remember, I've always said I'm going to be an artist. So were your some, parents encouraging of that? Did, were, were they involved in the arts? No, my mother was a restaurant owner, a French restaurant, uh, very successful. Um, and she was a single mother. So I grew up without, without a father. And my mother um, was very, back in those days, in Japan, very, very independent and a businesswoman. And she became one of the best restaurants uh, in Tokyo. And uh, yes, she, I, she hired um, me a private um, art teacher, I remember. 
and we would go out and sketch and draw and paint. Um, but the more I d did art, I heard everybody else going, oh my God, Koji, you're so good. You're so such an artist. And I go, okay, that feels good. <laughs> I'll do more, <laughs> you know? And I just kept doing art. And, and, you know, and my brother also was an artist. And he, I had a huge influence by him as well. He's five years older than me. So he was always way ahead of me. And I always looked up to him. He always encouraged me. Um, he went to Art Center College of uh, Design. And I came here to follow him, although Art Center did not accept me when I was eight. I was rejected. So I went to Cal Arts with the same portfolio they accepted me. And I went to Cal Arts, and which I think, now that I think about it, uh, was the right choice for me. Because Cal Arts was so crazy uh, in, the, in the 70s. Oh, yeah. Uh, Who were some of your teachers at Cal Arts? Oh, well, graphic designers, you know, mm -hmm. there's a teacher called Lou Danziger, mm -hmm. uh, who is still I'm in touch with, Jamie Audgers. Mm -hmm. Those two are probably my most influential teachers. John Baldessari, who was, Rick was teaching conceptual art at Cal Arts, and I had nothing to do with it meaning I had no idea what that was. And way later, I, re I went, my God, John Balsari was at Cal Arts. I could have taken his classes, and I, and I just didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, always the, um, the wisdom of, uh, of getting older is, um, you know, Wasted on young or whatever, though, however they say it. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, so when you came here, did you have an idea that this would be a permanent move for you? Or were you thinking, well, I'll go to school there and go back to Tokyo? I was, I was thinking about coming here, graduating, and going back to school. But four years at CalArts changed me completely. The, the freedom, the craziness, being able to be myself. I always felt that growing up in Japan, all the way to high school, that I was too different. I stuck out. I always wanted to do something different. Uh, now that I teach, that's one of the things that I teach my students. At Art Center, ironically, which is where I teach, uh, when but I, I, teach, I tell my students to be different. And that's how I always have been throughout my, my childhood. That if I'm gonna make something, I'm gonna make something different. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna do, I see great artists work. I wanna do that, but I'm not gonna do that. Wow, that is so good. I may want to do something like that, but how can I do it differently than that? That has always been one of my major, major principles. And I don't know if I'm, I have succeeded in that. Um, once in a while, I know that I have come up with something that, that's uniquely me. And it's mostly about ideas. Yeah. Well, don't you find, and this is something I talk to younger artists about a lot, don't you find that the more you are yourself and the more you kind of yeah. dig down, the more different you naturally are because you, we all have a unique voice and perspective. And the more you yes. follow that, you know, that's what I look yeah. for in, in any of the artists that I'm working with is um, have they found their voice? 
uh, yes. it, you, you know, and, and that gives it its own uniqueness. And so what's interesting to yep. me, a lot of times artists will um, feel like they've got a certain turf that, you know, I discovered this territory and they plant a flag in it. You know, this is my <laughs> style, this is my idea. And they don't want any, and then they want to protect it. And, and they don't want yes. any other travelers to that little piece of turf. Yes. Yes. I find it's it, it, when, when, no matter how similar someone's work may appear, no matter how similar that piece of turf may look, if you found your voice, if it comes from you, it doesn't matter. It's always yeah. you. You know, if, uh, you know, the example I often use is you could have Renoir on, and Monet sitting on the same riverbank painting the same scene. It's yeah. not about the scene. It's about that, that, approach that is uniquely theirs and you can see the same scene you go oh yeah that's a Renoir that's a Monet and mm -hmm. it couldn't be more different when you see the subtleties of it so yeah and I see that yeah. with LA artists you know some of the some of the artists who use a particular you know like work in resin for instance um uh there will be um pieces that could look fairly similar until you realize well they yeah they kind of look similar but this one's after this thing, and that one's after mm -hmm. something quite different when you start to dig below the surface appearance, so. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and in regards to finding your voice, I think that's one of the hardest things to do as yeah. an artist. And sometimes Person. you're able to, huh? As a person. A person, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. But you know, and all, and 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 related to creativity, dig, digging deep inside is is one of the hardest things. And even if you think you find it, found it, you lose it. Yeah. And then you find it again, and then after you find it. Does it, can you voice it, you know? Can you actually materialize it and make it into your own work? That's another challenge as well, you Oh, know? very much, yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, if you look at, for instance, Roy Lichtenstein's early work, um, mm -hmm. he was clearly looking for that, that, that voice and that style that that could uniquely express his voice. He also had a very ironic, subtle sense of humor. And you can see with his first pop art painting, which was called Nikki, I think I hooked a big one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, there was a great um, message in that because the thing that uh, he had hooked was this pop art idea of using these comic book frames to kind of um, funnel his ideas through about abstract expressionism and be able to comment on the other art um, styles of the day in a way that was fresh and original to him. And I always thought, you know, that was such a clear jumping off point for an artist who really found their voice and all of a sudden they're off to the races. But then later in the career, you wonder, well, did, did they get trapped by that style? You know, do they... Yes did it have enough possibility for them to kind of continue to change and grow? And, and in Lichtenstein's case, you know, I was kind of critical of that for a long time. And then I started to see he really had a lot of freedom within that limitation that he did continue to push forward with um, so that his work did continue to grow and evolve um, even with that, that, you know, that kind of restrictive lens through which he expressed himself. Yes. Yeah. I, I agree. And Hockney, I think, is another one. Mm -hmm. David Hockney. He, I, I see a, a consistent thread in, in his work, but he keeps inventing. And at, even at, at, at his age now, he is just, he is not afraid of reinventing. And I want to be like that. Yeah, yeah, I love that about Hockney. Yeah, he's always uh, very curious, 
um, studying uh, approaches uh, art historically that were done earlier. And then, you know, he's always, you know, the first to play with new technologies, you know, First it was yeah. copy machines, then fax machines, and now you know yeah. his iPad art is amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's always looking at you know expanding his vocabulary as an artist to express yeah. that that unique voice. At, at his age, Bill, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, isn't he in his nineties? No, he's in his 80s. Uh, I moved down here it, it, to Los Angeles from San Francisco in 1986. And, yeah. and uh, LACMA was, within months, had a show called Hockney at 50. Okay. <laughs> okay. So however long ago he was 50, what is that? Uh, 80, 80, 40, 80, 20, 80, 34 80. years ago, so he's 84. 84, okay. Yeah. Well, in your 80s and to be reinventing yourself, that, yeah. That's pretty courageous. Very much so. Well, and I, yeah. that was one of the things I loved about watching Ed Moses' work is that he was constantly yeah. challenging himself, <laughs> diving into the unknown. Um, and, and I think that's part of, you know, if you talk to writers and painters and musicians and performers, one of the things that drives them is that they, they learn something new by doing the work you know, it leads them to yes. a new place that they hadn't been before. They discover something yes. about themselves that they hadn't yes. uh, seen. So, yeah, yeah. that's certainly, um, to me, what, you know, gets people out of bed in the morning is, is the idea that you're going to learn something new, explore yeah. some new territory, and um, I think that's, that couldn't be a more exciting life. Yeah, because, because I, I, I feel that the older I get, and, and, and the more I learn, I, the more I realize there's more to learn. Right. And, and it gets more and more confusing in a, in a, in a, in a certain way. But you, you keep, I keep wanting to learn more to figure things out. And the more I figure things out, I go, well, you know, I really don't know. Yeah, you know, and and I I because I really don't know. I I need to learn more, you know, and I want to continue that uh, the rest of my life as a person, but also in my art. Yeah, which is why you never hear of artists talking about retirement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you retire exactly. from what? Doing what you love. Right, and this pandemic. I don't think bothers a lot of artists either. No, it's a very uh, kind of business as usual lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Koji, this has been really fun. Thank you so much that for you know, inviting uh, us into your studio today. And um, it's that great to see you. Bill. Bill, thank you, Bill, for continuing to have me as one of your artists. I'm hey, always but, grateful. Well, yeah. and as am I to, to work with you. I love you and I love your work, so. Same to you, Bill. Uh, be well and uh, let's stay in touch soon. Okay. Oh, and get me those images. I will. Okay. I, I do have a long piece, I realize. It's, the, it's the, one of the brushes. Oh, great. Excellent. You know, the, remember yeah. the brush? Yeah. That could be perfect. I have that. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll send you a picture. Okay. Thank you, Koji. All right. All right. Have Catch a great day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.